Welcome to our video. We uh, decided this would be a great way to uh, put together our, our presentation for the DPC Summit this year. Uh, Nick and I are really glad to be asked to come back and present. This is going to be a talk similar to the one that we gave a couple of years ago, but we've added some additional content about how to change your scope and uh, get a bigger scope of practice in DPC. We're going to go into why we think that's important. Okay, so here are some of the learning objectives that we're going for today. Um, basic stuff here with regard to expanding the scope of practice. We want you to learn opportunities where you can start adding even small things to your practice to really expand what you're offered both on the inpatient and in the outpatient setting. This is Dr. Nick with Antioch Med. Welcome you to the next episode of AFP Cribs. Welcome to my crib. Just rolled up these fat 16s. Come on in my door. Antioch Med was founded in 2016 by myself and Dr. Brandon Allman. Currently, we have four physicians working at our office. Come into our waiting room. We've got some nice social distancing animals coupled with masks. Sign that my wife drew, pretty awesome. Lots of babies that are being delivered, fresh coffee, bookshelf with all of our favorites, and best of all, a comfy couch. <laughs> Welcome to my crib. A few stats about our office. Four current physicians, two RNs, three medical assistants, nine exam rooms, one procedure room, a laboratory and medication dispensing area, 8,000 prescriptions dispensed last year, nearly 1,700 patients with our fourth provider just starting in August. Welcome to the Holton edition of DPC Cribs. I'm Vance Lassie, and you're at my crib, Holton Direct Care. We just rolled in in my 2002 Chevy Silverado which as you can tell is all pimped out with all the stuff you want, including dirt and cow manure. Our clinic is only 750 square feet. It's a small rental facility. We've been here for going on five years. This is our lobby in my nurse's area. We have the most important things that you need in the lobby, including a place to get lots of fresh coffee, and a copy machine that we got that the bank was throwing away. So it was free, very important. Beyond that, you have your obligatory plant, your local art, your Christmas tree that never comes down, and your business sign that you made yourself. The couch is from Ikea. It's not ideal, but you know, it gets the job done for now. This facility is small. It's only 750 square feet, and it's got an exam room slash office for me, a second room that we use for a lab and pharmacy, in this waiting room with one small bathroom that we share with the neighbors who run a company next door. But why don't we go take a look at my new crib? All right, we're back at my new crib, Holden Direct Care 2.0. This is the new facility that we're working on now. We hope to have it open within the next two months. Parking lot just got finished last week. Inside you'll see our lobby, which I used a whole lot of uh, reclaimed barn wood. I took out of a barn that's on the same property. And we have our own lobby bathroom now. This facility also has a business office, a full bottomy area, a lab and pharmacy, patient bathrooms, and staff bathrooms. Infusion room, consultation room, first storage closet, big surgery slash procedure room with tons of storage, physician's office, break slash meeting room, a large room that we're going to use for storage and probably ultimately fitness and physical therapy. Not one, not two, but three exam rooms. As you can see, I'm still working on the flooring. Hope to have this whole place done in the next couple of months, just in time for the big DPC Alliance Mastermind course that we'll be doing here in Kansas later this year. So uh, thanks for coming to see my crib and I'll check you later. I got to get back to work. So we think it's a great idea to broaden your scope, obviously, but we really think that this is just the right thing to do. So if you're trained to do something 
um, as a, especially as a family doctor, you should, um, you should operate at the highest level of your training. It really adds a lot of value to your practice as well. And this is something where we're, as, as DPC doctors, we're always trying to find ways to add value to your membership. And truthfully, if you want something done right, you might as well just get it done yourself because we've all seen ways that, that um, specialists or other um, healthcare providers um, do partway or in incomplete jobs. Um, and really we're the best ones to make sure that we are incentivized to, to give our patients the very best care. In a minute, you're going to see some pictures that Nick is going to present to you showing a really good example of if you want something done right, do it yourself and a specialist letting somebody down. Before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about other reasons to broaden your scope. Another one is job satisfaction and lifelong learning. In the direct care model, we're able to add so much to our, uh, to our scope of practice that you're, just, you're not bored. This, it's not the same thing every day. You're not cranking through. You're not in the, you know, the, the hamster wheel trying to crank 40 people people in and out, referring everything out. Instead, you get to, God forbid, act like a doctor and use your head a little bit and uh, do some homework. And you never, uh, you never stop learning uh, whenever you keep a broad scope of practice. Um, another thing uh, is there is potential additional revenue. Some direct primary care doctors uh, include all the extra stuff that they do mem- as part of the membership. Others have different ways of structuring their, how they get paid. And by doing additional procedures or other broader scope of practice, Things are able to bring in extra money by doing maybe elective things or you know, whatever it might be. And the last thing is referrals and retention. People really love it when you do a broader scope of practice and aren't referring them to lots of other people. It saves them time, money, and all kinds of things. And they tell their friends, and that gives them uh, that gives them more. You might call it loyalty or uh, patient, or you know, if you want to call it customer loyalty. And they tell their friends, and it's the reason why at least at Holden Direct Care, our advertising budget is zero. So first piece that we're going to talk about is mostly broadening our outpatient scope. And this is what most of us do as um, direct primary care doctors. So this is where the majority of our focus is going to be. This is an example from my practice. Um, and we talked about this a little bit at the, at the last conference, but it's such a great example of why doing something yourself is the, it's the right thing to do. And if you want it done right, a lot of times that's what has to happen. So this is a patient um, with permission given to share the story as well as the images who actually presented to my house. He, as a friend of mine, lives in my community and had accidentally shot himself in the hand with a pistol while he was cleaning it. Why? had a bullet in the chamber, still not sure. He, I put him in my car, drove him to the, the ER, got x-rays, thank the Lord, no, no overt fractures, got scheduled with a hand surgeon and presented to them two days following. The hand surgeon walked into his, uh, the patient walked into his office, looked at the patient, charged him 150 bucks, told him to go wash his hand in the sink because the wound was dirty and to go home and come back two days later and pay him an additional 150 bucks and he would address it then. Patient presented back to my office and was absolutely irate and said, either you, me, Dr. Nick, are going to take care of this or I'm not, it's not ever going to be fixed. And so in the process, I ended up doing all the, the wound care, allowed it to heal by secondary intention because at that point in time, it was too far out from um, being able to be, be closed. He had really an excellent cosmetic outcome, little, little to any nerve damage. And you can see in the second image, this is the way that you retain patients. And he's one of my greatest referral sources. All right, with regard to outpatient scope expansion, one of the things that we wanted to do is just kind of put together a list of things that you can look into adding to your, to your procedure or to your practice if you don't already. Now, obviously, a lot of it's procedures, but not all of it. So the list here shows um, uh, some of the procedures that direct primary care docs across the country do. Obviously, the most common ones you're going to see are things like abscess, incision, and drainage minor surgery, cryotherapy, lesion removal, joint injections, those kinds of things. But obviously, even more advanced procedures are possible. Uh, Bastectomy is an example that both Nick and I do. Hemorrhoid excision uh, and other minor surgical procedures. Then there's office services. A lot of doctors do OMT. Uh, We do extra physicals, immigration physicals or DOT physicals, uh, stress testing, uh, even body composition analysis, bone density, uh, just depending on the equipment and your expertise. Travel medicine, and you can also do non-member services. Some some doctors, myself included, if you have a day when you're not particularly busy uh, in your office, you can open it up to do, you know, maybe somebody in the community has a nasty laceration and needs sutures. You can sew them up for a fraction of the ER. I mean, it would be part of your business model, but you could do things like that on a given day if you so choose. 
And even if you're not doing, um, doing hands-on procedures, there may be ways that you can use your brain by, um, by giving second opinions, interpreting outside um, medical records, um, doing you know, family therapy or other types of, of counseling. Um, there are a lot of DPC docs that do this through um, just weight reduction, dietary counseling. Um, so there's ways that you can expand your scope that don't necessarily involve um, having a scalpel in your hand. Okay, so if you're working on expanding your scope of practice for your direct, direct primary care clinic, one of the things you need to know is what kind of resources are you going to use to help yourself get more confidence with procedures or things that you haven't done in a while, maybe since residency or whatever. And so obviously, uh, there's a lot of resources we'll talk about, such as you know having good mentors, having um, uh, resources online, and honestly, the majority of them are online, whether you're watching videos, whether you're talking to specialists online to get ideas, that's important. But there's still, believe it or not, a role for books. Even though many of them are obsolete the minute they come off the printing press, there are books that many of us use every day. And so you don't need a big bookshelf, but having a few books is a good idea. So I thought I'd quickly show you uh, during our tour of our practice some of my books. So one that you will use a lot if you're getting into procedures is Finnegar and Fowler's Procedures for Primary Care. This book gets a lot of use. And um, I'm a huge nerd, as you can see, because mine is actually autographed by Dr. Finnegar himself, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, Finnegar and Fowler's book is worth a lot. Um, another one that you will find yourself using all the time if you get into orthopedics is Fracture Management for Primary Care. This is the IFN Hatch book. This is actually my second um, version of this. I had the second edition. I literally wore it out and the uh, index fell off and I lost it. And I had to buy a new copy. That book gets a lot of use. Um, the Sports Medicine Patient Advisor also is out in two editions. This book is fantastic for doing orthopedic stuff of any kind uh, because not only does it tell you, um, it's basically handouts you can make for the patient. So it tells them a lot about the patient, a lot about the disease in FAQ format. But then at the end of each section, it also has the rehabilitation home exercises uh, to give your patient so that they can do uh, some PT on their own. And a lot of times you can keep your patient out of the physical therapist's office to save them a lot of money. So the sports medicine patient advisor is huge. The only other two that I would say you really have to have are going to be one or two uh, derm atlases because full color derm atlases just never stop paying off um, and paying for themselves in use. So uh, this is the uh, Habif book. Then uh, there's also the Wolf Johnson Saavedra book, uh, or this also known as the Fitz Fitzpatrick. So um, any, any derm atlas will probably work. There's a lot of good ones out there. But um, these are books that um, have been very useful for me and a lot of other uh, DPC docs. There's office gynecology, lots of other things, obviously. But in general, you'll find that you're using online resources for the most part. But having a few go-to resources is valuable whenever it comes to certain procedures. So uh, hopefully that gives you a little bit of clue. It's very small. I don't need a lot on my bookshelf. The majority of the stuff on my bookshelf are just these handful of books. I use a lot. Everything else is online. Um, but particularly in procedures, you're going to be using a lot of online videos to help yourself uh, you know, practice and uh, make sure you're doing things the way everybody's doing it uh, with uh, the most evidence-based care, too. So all righty, that's it for my bookshelf. So if you're ready to start uh, expanding your scope, and some of that is in procedures, we thought what we would do today, since we had this opportunity with uh, the Rona upon us and having this vir virtual conference, uh, to get some videos that we could put together and uh, sort of show you guys exactly how we do it on sort of on site at our clinics. So um, we're going to get started by to show you how we do cryotherapy, which is an easy one for anybody to add on. So we do have a couple of cryotherapy videos. We do things a little different at our two clinics. And so we thought we'd give you an idea of how you, two different people can do things two different ways. You get to figure it out as you go. This is a cryotherapy hack for DPC docs. So in our office, we tend to use um, cryotherapy that comes in these medical freeze spray um, canisters. Um, they come in a variety of different manufacturers. We tend to buy this one from Amazon for about 20 bucks a bottle. Um, you can spray this directly onto a patient's skin, but it tends to kind of get all over and make a big mess. So instead, what we commonly do is use a Q-tip that we cut in half, but one that has a lumen down the middle of it. And the nice part is that this fits directly into the opening of the, um, of the medical free spray. So you just squeeze it right in like this. And now when you go to spray, if you spray it off away from the patient's skin and then bring it over and touch it onto the skin, you can immediately freeze right where you um, want the area to be frozen. 
and you can even see it starts to form some crystals on it just so it gets so fr so frozen cold. Um, this is probably the primary way that most DPC doctors use um, this form of cryotherapy. The other option is that you can take um, some of the ear speculums and if you just use a scissor you can snip the top of it right off of there and then if you take this and put it immediately onto the patient's skin you can then only put the free spray right down onto the skin in that circular pattern. Okay, this is Vance. You just heard from Nick about how he does cryotherapy at Antioch Med. We use liquid nitrogen here at Holton Direct Care. So uh, the reason for that uh, is basically uh, it gets a little colder and I couldn't find affordable air cans when I started. So I did go ahead and uh, make the investment in liquid nitrogen. So I'll show you how to use nitrogen in your clinic if you want to go that way. Uh, there's obviously pros and cons each way. The biggest uh, pro is that nitrogen gets colder, so you can't get a deeper freeze. Uh, obviously the biggest con is that it costs a little bit more, so depending on how what your frequency for cryotherapy is and how you charge for it, it might increase your overhead in, in it to some degree. So first you're gonna have to get yourself one of these. This is called a doer. Okay, this is a doer. Uh, it's spelled D-E-W-A-R if you want to buy one and Google it and find a good spot online to buy them and stuff. Doers are not cheap, they're highly insulated. Um, there's different kinds of them out there, I'm not going to go into that in the video, but the cheapest one, for, this is a 5 liter doer, the cheapest one I've been able to find is in the $260 range, all the way up to $800 plus. Uh, so they're not cheap. Uh, let me show you how I do things here. Just pop that out and pour a little of your nitrogen. And I just use a insulated coffee cup type of thing. And I just use a couple of cotton tipped applicators. And I leave one in the nitrogen. I use one to freeze your lesion. Whenever it starts warming up, drop it back in the nitrogen, grab the other one, and just go back and forth. Works great. Uh, you can buy the little, um, little spray guns, which have a pressure relief valve and stuff on them. And they'll usually hold. Uh, 10 or 12 ounces of nitrogen in them all day so you can use them if you're doing lots of cryotherapy in your office but those guns those little canisters or high pressure release valves that are in them and stuff are not cheap I think I looked at them they're like 600 bucks so maybe if I find a, a good one uh, sometime affordably I'll get one but for now this technique works great cost me 20 I, I think anymore between 20 and 40 bucks to fill up my doer the part of the reason it's a little more expensive is I have a delivery fee because I'm so far away from the nitrogen place because we're in a rural area it might be a little cheaper to get refills in an urban area, I'm not sure. Um, so that's how we do nitrogen here. You can still use liquid nitrogen and use uh, ear speculums and those kinds of things uh, that Nick talked about in his video, that part doesn't change. One way to save money when you're using liquid nitrogen that we've found here is a tank like this will hold uh, five liters of nitrogen for about three weeks and it slowly boils off, even though it's well insulated, obviously, uh, it boils off uh, pretty quick, so within a few weeks this tank's going to be empty. So rather than keeping it full all the time and paying you know 30 bucks or whatever it is to fill it every three weeks, what we do is we just use it when it's when it's gone and it's in, it's dried out. We do not refill it. When people need something done that's for cryotherapy, we just start a list and we just we call it the cryo list. And any given time we have three or four people on the cryo list, and we'll let the tank set empty for two or three weeks. And then once we have enough people on the list. We'll call, have the tank filled, and then we call everybody up and bring them all in the same week, get their cryo done, and that way we get a lot more uh, bang for our buck on our nitrogen refills. Commonly, equipment sterilization is one of the um, limitations in DPC practices, so we're going to go over how we accomplish that at our practices. In general, purchasing um, inexpensive instruments from eBay and then sterilizing them um, is what most DPC physicians, especially after the initial ramp up phase, usually end up, um, end up doing. Uh, this is our um, sterilization area. We have uh, old autoclave. So this guy is actually, if you look here, it was manufactured in Canada in 1965 and it works perfectly. So um, the main considerations with these are that they need to get up to pressure, they need to get up to temperature, and they need to pass a spore test. So with spore tests, we most commonly use um, mail-in test strips that you um, uh, put a strip inside of there, um, uh, you mail off um, the, um, the spore kit to a manufacturer and they tell you whether or not it passed and we do that usually once a month. Uh, we actually purchased our autoclave um, from a retiring tattoo artist 
um, and it's passed its um, spore test on every time that we've we've sent it in. Um, a little DPC hack on this, so you can frequently buy um, sterilized um, four by four gauze. You can also make your own. So you buy a bunch of unsterile gauze, put it into a pack, and here you can see this um, from our steam. It turned the external and internal uh, controls uh, positive. So this is a sterilized package of four by four gauze. So obviously surgical procedures are an easy way to bring a tremendous amount of value to your patients. Um, even very easy, the easiest surgical procedures, think, think along the lines of removing skin tags, are actually very cost prohibitive for the cash paying patient inside the system. So we can take all of these outpatient surgical procedures that are so easy to do and bring them to our patients included with their membership. And that brings a level of value unlike anything else in medicine. I mean, you can take, spend one day taking a couple of uh, unsightly moles or uh, biopsying some potential skin cancers, doing some cryotherapy. And in one day, the patient's paid for their entire year's membership and what they saved over having that procedure done on the inside. If you aren't doing surgical procedures already and you're looking into getting an autoclave and being able to make your own, um, uh, your own kits for these different procedures, we thought we'd throw some, together a few videos to kind of show you uh, how to build those kits uh, to, for use in your clinic without, without breaking the bank. All right, this shows kind of the things I use in my kits set up for, for my biopsies for skin. So first of all, I usually keep, keep a few of these. This is just a pair of forceps with teeth and a pair of iris scissors. Uh, you can buy like 10 packs of both of these on eBay for just a few bucks, very cheap. Uh, sometimes the cheaper tools do rust a little bit more easily after they've been autoclaved a few times, but you're out of nothing to throw a pair of them away or put them in your tackle box for fishing trips because um, the same kind of uh, brand name tools are hundreds of dollars, so you can get a thousand pairs for that. So anyway, I usually keep uh, one pair of virus scissors and one pair of uh, uh, forces with teeth per kit, and I usually have some, several of these ready. And again, my punches are disposable. This is two, three, four, five, and six millimeter punches. They're color coded. I just keep a pile of those in my office, so I can just grab whichever one of those I need in one of these. Uh, you can also put a piece of gauze in this, as Nick said, as well. If I'm doing a shave biopsy kit, um, it's basically the same thing as this, except for it also has uh, one of these little razors in there and a piece of gauze or two. Uh, I don't have any of those made up because I used them up today in the office, so we're going to have to make some of those. But anyway, that is how we do biopsy kits. One little hack that we use on our shave biopsies, you can buy these little flexible razors, you know, that you can um, use for shave biopsies. That they have, they're called biop blades, or there's different brands of them, but it's just a little, they have little rubber handles on both sides and a flexible razor blade in them. Uh, but they're like three bucks each or something like that, and those add up pretty quick. Uh, for a couple of bucks, you can get a box like this, which has, um, I don't know, 100 double-edged razor blades in them. And they're just the old school razor blades, just like that. Uh, these go real nicely into one of these kits with a pair of forceps, one of these, throw them in the autoclave, and these are incredibly flexible, and you can get the exact same uh, technique for your shave biopsies for a penny each or something like that, so it saves lots of money. Okay, this is what I keep in my vasectomy kit. This is a set that just uh, got done being scrubbed. I'm getting ready to throw all this in the autoclave. So I have it set now. I figured I'd show you guys. The main reason I'm, I'm showing you this, anybody can look up what you put in a kit. Uh, I'm just kind of showing you what I put, but there's, a, there's one specific reason I'm pointing this out. I referred earlier to that I use a lot of these instruments that I get, uh, forceps and iris scissors and stuff like that. You can get them in 10 packs on eBay for five or six bucks, and they work fine. If they rust after you know five or 10 times through the autoclave, you can throw them away, and you're out almost nothing. However, we have found that that is not always the way to go for all instruments. For a pair of forceps, who cares? They're very rarely going to, that's not going to fail you very often. However, in the case of a delicate procedure such as vasectomy, I did spend the big money on the name brand Dissecting Forceps and Vas Clamp. These are the good ones. Uh, these do wear out quickly if you get the cheap ones uh, and you get a good pair, they'll last you for a long time. Okay, we're going to talk about circumcision. This is a great thing to add to your practice. It uh, brings a lot of value for patients, especially for patients who are paying cash for delivery or maybe they deliver at home like some people do. Um, circumcision inside the system is incredibly expensive. This is an easy thing that you can do and bring value to your clinic. So we're going to talk about the equipment you need to keep circumcision as part of your scope of practice. So we're going to start by uh, looking at a circumstraining board. Um, this is what a circumstraining board looks like. 
they're very expensive if you buy these new. Try to find a used one if you can. A lot of docks just make their own. It doesn't have to be baby shaped. It just has to have these slots to put a foam uh, Velcro in so that you can restrain the baby's thighs. Uh, the, their arms do not need to be restrained on a board. What we do is we actually uh, we actually take the baby and we put their arms like this and we swaddle them and the babies tend to like that a lot better because they're not held kind of akimbo like that. As far as the things you need to have in stock uh, for prep, you need uh, just some alcohol prep pads, 1% lidocaine, weasel tuberculin or insulin syringes work great for that. Um, an iodine swab stick and a sterile uh, fenestrated drape gets your prep and your uh, anesthesia taken care of. And as far as the things that you need to put in your auto autoclave, this is what my kit looks like. Um, I have a straight hemostat, two curved hemostats, a forceps with teeth, a blunt probe, and then I use the GOMCO uh, method. And so if you use a GOMCO, you're going to need uh, this kit, which is four pieces. They come in all kinds of different sizes. I use a 1.3 almost all the time. Sometimes you'll want larger or smaller ones. If you stock more than just a 1.3, you do need to be careful to make sure that you test before every circumcision that the bell fits into the plate. You don't want, for instance, to have a 1.3 bell and a 1.4 plate for obvious reasons. So you definitely want to test that every time if you stock multiple um, uh, GOMCOs. Uh, and then you can always take a couple of pieces of regular gauze and keep that in your kit. All of this is available online, very affordable. You do not have to get this from medical supply houses. These things can be purchased uh, quite affordably as we've discussed in the video previously. Uh, incision and drainage is an important part of any family physician's practice. They're, you know, abscess drainage is necessary and, and not difficult. Um, I'm a big fan of drainage, as most of us are, but it's not still widely taught in residency. Still a lot of people doing uh, packing. So uh, the vessel loop uh, technique is probably the best for drainage that most of us would agree. This link that you see on your screen is a great link uh, to uh, the MRAP uh, ER podcast, and he has a very good uh, demo of how this is done. So I highly encourage you to watch this video. And now we're going to show you uh, my video of how I make a basic uh, vessel loop IND kit. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a vessel loop IND kit. Uh, for those of you who heard me talk before, you know that I'm a big fan of vessel loop drainage for abscess uh, incision and drainage rather, and so basically drainage rather than packing in almost all cases. So I'm going to show you how I make my kit. I make it very affordably and some of the different options and ways you can do that. So let's come down to the, to the uh, table here and I'll just show you. So the kit's very easy. You can use one of these three and a half by nine inch uh, sterilization bags for it. Really all you need is a curved hemostat, uh, a forceps, and the vessel loop. Now vessel loops, they come in packs of two and most of the time you're only going to be using one. So if you use one, now you've, you've opened your sterile package, you can take the other one and you can put it in with this and sterilize it. These are made of silicone so they can take the heat and you can sterilize that and use it so you can make one package work for two different um, incisions and drainages, assuming you're not using more than one in the procedure. Um, you're going to need something to break down loculations other than probably just the, the uh, curved hemostat. So usually you're going to use a cotton tipped applicator. So if you buy the cheap ones like this, you can throw one of those in there as well and sterilize it and it's one less sterile thing to buy. But they're not all that expensive to buy sterilely. So if you don't want to add these to the kit, you can always buy content applicators that are pre-sterilized you know, pre in the little paper kits and you don't have to include those. You can do that either way. Um, so these are the things you're going to add to your sterilization kit. Now, a lot of these kits, like biopsy kits and stuff you make, you'll probably notice that we um, usually throw a piece of gauze or something in there just to sterilize it and have it. For an abscess, you're usually going to be mopping up lots, if it's a big abscess, particularly lots of pus and things like that. And so one or two pieces of gauze aren't, aren't going to get the job done. So in a case like that, I'm usually using... Uh, something along these lines, a box of uh, sterile uh, sponges. You can make these kits your own in a separate uh, bag if you want to, but I think sometimes by the time you add your non-sterile gauze and the cost of the larger pack, you're probably not much savings over these pre-made packages. Plus what's nice about these is you can open up and then use the little uh, dish to you know, hold the iodine, thing, iodine solutions if you need to. So for abscess, I'm usually using one of these things. Another thing that you can sterilize and add to the kit is a small 11 blade because you don't necessarily need a handle for this for most INDs and you can just drop an 11 blade in there. I usually use sterile, um, pre-sterilized disposable um, uh, scalpels so I, I just, I don't keep these in the kit but you can easily just buy the blades alone very cheap and add one of those to the kit to continue uh, adding to savings if, if you want to. Um, the other thing you do when you do the vessel loop incision and drainage is you need to irrigate those wounds after you've opened them up, uh, broken down your loculations. 
And with irrigation, there's cheap and there's expensive. The expensive way to do it is by using buying a bunch of these little pre-filled um, saline syringes, which you can just kind of jam in there and rinse them out. And these work fine if you're doing just a small little abscess or something like that and using one or two of these isn't altogether that cost prohibitive and it's nice and quick. However, if you have a large wound and you're going to be really irrigating with a lot of sterile saline, um, first of all, I think there's some pretty decent evidence that you can use tap water for those. But assuming you want to use sterile saline, the cheap way to do it is not to use a whole bunch of these. Instead, get yourself a larger syringe, like a 20 or a 60, and then just buy a sterile saline in these jugs like this and fill them and use those to uh, irrigate. And that'll save you a lot of money. Basic orthopedic. Um, care is a great way to expand um, some of the scope that you offer in your practice. And Vance and I do this very similarly, but we're going to show you mostly a lot of the, the materials that we use in our office, um, along with some of the resources. So stay tuned. Um, so this is what we keep in our office. Um, so the first thing that you're going to need um, is some sort of splinting material. And we tend to use this rolled um, version of splinting material that has um, built-in fiberglass as well as um, uh, uh, padding. And it works really well to create splints. Um, we keep it in two, three, and four inch versions. Um, you'll also need cast padding. And we just keep rolls of this. Um, we tend to keep um, uh, two inch, three inch, and four inch rolls. We just keep it in white um, and we tell people you can be your own artist um, so we don't have lots of different colors. Um, you'll also need some form of cotton stockinette and so we keep two inch, three inch, four inch, and then a compressive version that works well a little bit for littler kids. Um, we also uh, keep surgery tube, which is a finger um, tube gauzing. Um, and then from a splint standpoint, we keep finger splints, usually wrist splints, as well as um, arm slings. Um, and that's essentially the extent of the, the materials we use for casting. We also have a used cast saw, cast spreaders, um, and uh, uh, cast scissors that we tend to use. So one part of the expansion of the scope of practice is unfortunately not legal in all 50 states, and that is dispensing, uh, having a dispensing pharmacy as part of your practice. Uh, this is something that most DPC doctors do, but because of the some states don't allow doctors to dispense from their office, which makes it a challenge. And there are ongoing legal battles, and we hope to see those uh, uh, those states change because there's no reason doctors shouldn't be able to take care of that for their patients. It saves them a lot of time, money, and trips to the pharmacy and everything else. Um, dispensing from the from your own office does several things for your value. One is you can dispense your medications to patients at, at cost, which saves them sometimes over 90, 90 even over 95% on some prescriptions, which is obviously a, a massive value add. Um, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna say it's perfect. It does take extra time. It's more work. It, it, there's more that goes into it. You have to maintain an inventory and things like that. But again, the whole point is you need to give patients a reason to spend uh, their money every month at your office. And this is one we've, we've all really found to be very helpful uh, for our value proposition. It's, it's accomplished in different ways. Uh, everyone has different workflows that they make it work, but it is very handy. So we did think we'd uh, put together a couple of little videos just to sort of show you uh, how we do things in our office. Um, my, my, I'm actually moving. My new clinic is going to open here in about, uh, in about six weeks. And I have a huge a uh, new modern pharmacy that I can't wait, but it's still under construction. I don't even have my pharmacy shelves installed yet. So uh, we're going to show you how I'm doing things in my crowded one, but um, definitely have a good update for y'all next year. Hey, this is Dr. Nick. Just wanted to go over how our pharmacy or dispensary operates. Um, adding medication dispensing in a direct primary care practice can be a great additional benefit for your patients. From our experience, it really in, in, increases compliance um, in patients taking their medications and dramatically reduces expense, although it can be a little bit tricky to operate. Um, this is something where it can be um, very simple to very complex, and that's something that we've grown in as our practice has increased in size over time. Um, for our practice, we've dispensed about 8,000 prescriptions in the last uh, year, um, and um, inside each of those uh, prescriptions, there may be multiple medications that are filled. So this is something that takes a decent amount of coordination and um, organization. Uh, but I do think it's worth the benefits. 
Um, we currently stock nearly 200 medications and order these um, from four different um, medication wholesalers. Um, we have a policy and procedure manual and you can see an overview of that um, is here that goes over practically how we go about dispensing medications to reduce errors um, and stay um, legal within the Kansas guidelines. We're governed by the Kansas Board of Medicine and not the Board of Pharmacy, and those have some individual um, guidelines that are state specific, and you can look at those on DPC Frontier um, that is Phil Eskew's website. Um, we typically order medications in weekly and stock them um, in larger inventories. Our current inventory is approximately eight to eight to ten thousand dollars worth of medication, so it's a it's a decent expense. However, when we first opened, we had about thirty to forty medications and a total um, inventory of about three hundred dollars. So it can vary really widely, and there's lots of places to start with this. Um, We've also um, had several iterations of the ways that we go about refilling medications because it can be a really time intensive process. Um, so at first we started by just filling medications by hand with a manual counter to then upgrading at 100 patients to uh, uh, an electronic pill counter. Um, we initially went from you call and we fill your medicines the same day and you can swing by any time to uh, pick them up to a refill schedule where we would order medications on Monday that were requested, fill them on Tuesdays, um, and, uh, re and have them ready for pickup on Wednesdays. When we were doing that, we had a hanging bag system that you can see here, um, and we just used the normal um, shelf uh, organizers that you can buy at any home store, and these are book bags that most libraries use, as well as pharmacies, to stock medications. Um, currently, especially with coronavirus concerns, we've moved to nearly doing all of our um, dispensing um, through the mail. So we um, have patients contact their physician directly for refills, fill the medications, and then mail them directly to the patients um, through our medical record. Um, currently, the other um, change that we're implementing is a quarterly refill system where it's automated. There's four refill dates a year, and every patient that's on a, on a stable dose of medication automatically will get that medication mailed to them um, on one of four dates um, in a year. So we're hoping that increases compliance and also um, helps with ease of requesting um, medications and um, also streamlines our office workflow dramatically. Um, the, our um, office organizes our medications into these acro style bins that are stackable um, by medication name. And you can see we have um, shelving for all of these or along with a variety of different types of um, uh, areas to stock them. So that's an overview of kind of how our um, pharmacy operates and glad to answer questions if folks have them. Here's the original original cabinetry. As you can see, we keep a lot of even over-the-counter things in stock. We, we save people a lot of money even on over-the-counter meds. We do things like ibuprofen in the large 800 and 600 milligram bottles. Uh, generally an 800 milligram tablet from us is about the same price as the 200 from the store, so we can get people a lot of savings on medications like that as well. This shows how we package uh, meds here at Holden Direct Care. I'm currently uh, stocking six different packaging uh, methods. One is uh, for just somebody needs just a few pills of something. We actually use these little paper uh, things, which are super cheap. These little envelopes, they work great. Uh, I use uh, these small uh, to large bottles. This is currently the biggest size I have. I have carried bigger sizes in the past, but I found that usually that's not necessary because if you're dispensing that many meds, you can usually just dispense in the bottle that the meds come in from the wholesaler. Um, I use old file cabinet drawers, which work really well for uh, small, medium, and large bottles. So that's how we do that. We also keep these liquid bottles. I don't generally dispense a whole lot of liquid medication, but one thing that's really helpful if you're using a, a liquid dexamethasone, the IV dexamethasone, um, as an oral uh, treatment for croup, it's very, very affordable and it works great. And what I do is I do the math, it's usually 0, 0 0.6 milligrams per kilo, and I actually put the, I just squirt a little bit of the dexamethasone, the whole dose that the child's going to need into this bottle. Then I cap that off and send it with mom and dad, tell them to put an ounce or two of chocolate milk in it, shake it up, drink the whole thing, and you've got your all in one treatment in one little cheap bottle. And uh, one vial of dexamethasone will last you the whole croup season. 
still in the pharmacy. A couple other little things I want to show you. I do, do sell a few things that aren't medication just because we can save people so much money. Uh, several different nebulizers can be had from most of the wholesale pharmacies. This nebulizer, uh, which, which also comes with tubing and the little mouthpiece and everything, uh, I believe I get this for $27, sell them at cost. Uh, albuterol and epitropium albuterol combination medications are very affordable, like I think, I don't know, four or five bucks a box or whatever. Uh, so we can save people a ton of money over buying nebulizers from a patient supply house. Uh, I do the same thing with blood pressure monitors. I think our blood pressure monitors are like 16 bucks. Hey, this is Dr. Nick. At our office, we tend to do lots of obstetrics, and because of that, we absolutely need an ultrasound. There are several portable solutions that lots of DPC physicians um, tend to use and um, have even uh, teamed up across the United States to head to ultrasound uh, training courses. Um, this is something that you can use clinically in your practice um, without a whole lot of, uh, of prior skill with it. So we tend to use this a lot in our office for dating ultrasounds, um, limited obstetric follow-ups for interval growth, um, fluid biophysical profiles, um, but we also use it a decent amount for um, limited cardiac views, um, for um, ejection fraction, um, uh, abdominal ultrasound, especially for gallbladders, um, uh, DVT evaluation, small parts, musculoskeletal. So there's lots of different options. Um, for us, we actually found a very used unit. So you can see this guy's kind of a dinosaur um, for a thousand bucks, but it's got five probes. Um, so we can do lots of different evaluations um, and it's worked wonderfully for us for the needs that we have. Um, that's something that you can frequently pick up from an imaging center that's um, trying to get rid of these. Outpatient management of um, in diagnosis of sleep apnea is something that is definitely possible by most family doctors, especially for relatively uncomplicated cases. Um, In-home sleep studies can be relatively easily obtained by several different companies, whether local or national. Um, there's many groups that will mail all the equipment to a patient's home for them to do an in-home sleep study. And many times you can get a uh, uh, in-home sleep study along with report for about 125 to 150 bucks. Um, and there's several online um, uh, wholesalers that will um, sell direct to patients with a, a prescription um, auto, um, auto sensing CPAPs along with all the supplies um, to be able to get um, patients set up um, and running with a, an in-home um, CPAP to treat sleep apnea. Otherwise, if you're like Vance and I, you also can help um, help patients buy um, a lot of the CPAP related supplies, um, either secondhand or from um, used stores, um, and then help them to set these up. And it's, um, it's something that's absolutely possible and we're glad to help if you have questions in regards to that. There's definitely ways that you can save people money and it never ceases to amaze me how much people are paying uh, or their insurance is paying and their deductibles are maxing out on uh, sleep apnea therapy. I mean, people are paying thousands and thousands of dollars for, uh, for sleep apnea treatment and it doesn't have to be that expensive. Worst case scenario, you might be in the $800 range from diagnosis to treatment. That's the worst case scenario. We're gonna get a little bit away from um, some of the outpatient based ways that you can broaden your scope and move into um, more inpatient, um, inpatient options for broadening your scope. Now, Vance and I have some, um, some bias in this and that we, um, we think it's a wise thing to do, although practically um, this is something that likely fewer DPC doctors are going to do, though we really think this could be a huge way that you can add value to your practice. Um, and the biggest reason for that is just that you know your patient so much better than any hospitalist ever will. Um, you've had, you, you have their medication list and all their, um, their chronic medical problems along with all their, their family history and all the social stuff um, already down um, before even going in to see them. Um, the other piece is that you're also able to really coordinate the, the care from the inpatient to outpatient setting so much better. Um, when I do this and go up and see my patients in the hospital um, and I'm discharging them, the nurses are always like, well, are you going to bring, uh, send, a, send their prescriptions to the pharmacy? And I always say, well, I just brought them in a paper bag up to them from my clinic. Um, and that just, that's the type of continuity that makes sure that a patient has the things they need so they can be successful at home. Um, 
I think a lot of people are really concerned too about, do I have the knowledge to be able to care for a patient in the hospital? And the, my response to this is that, yes, hospitalists do have the day in and day out um, exposure to a lot of things that are related to hospital medicine that may be different from the outpatient scope, but they're not the only ones with up to date. And you've got more time than they do, along with all of the the past medical history, social history, um, additional time to be able to deal with the patient, to be able to look up all these types of things. And really, if you're going to spend all the time doing social rounds and coordination of care and um, dealing with the case manager and cleaning up the, the errors of hospitalists, you might as well be the one to manage the patient anyway. And along those lines, I would add, uh, when it comes to the the comparison of the direct primary care uh, physician caring for their patient in the hospital versus a hospitalist. A hospitalist at any given time might be taking care of, you know, 10, 20, upwards of 20 patients. And they're, they're juggling a lot of, a lot of care. And the odds are most of the time, a direct primary care physician has a patient in the hospital. That's the only patient they have. So you have time to spend a lot of time whether it's researching or just spending time looking into the case and digging into the case where hospitalists might want to do it. They just don't have time. They're, they're, they're too busy and they're referring things. And, and, and beyond that, you can also, uh, you can consult uh, cardiology just like, just like they can if, if the patient needs a heart cap. So, okay. Yeah, um, I think the, the other piece is that, that um, you are incentivized by the model of direct primary care to care for your patient. A hospitalist is incentivized to keep an insurance company happy. Um, and just by the basic difference of that, you are in a much better place to offer excellent care to your patient. Amen, brother. All right. Uh, there are some barriers and difficulties when it comes to doing inpatient care. Um, one is hospital privileges. Depending on where, where you live and what hospital you, you want to use, there can be issues. Uh, for instance, some hospitals only, only allow privileges to those who they employ. Uh, some university hospitals won't give privileges to anybody in the community unless they're not, they're, a, you know, an employed physician with the university hospital, as an example. Um, now, there are some things where uh, certain hospitals require certain board certifications. You might run into turf battles. Um, there's always issues with administrators and uh, money people who don't understand um, Medicare opt out and they don't understand that an opted out physician can still take care of their patient in the hospital and the hospital will still get paid by Medicare even if the doctors opted out. The hospitals have never worked for someone who does that and so it's very perplexing to them and they often don't want uh, the challenge of learning how to do it. Um, being on staff at a hospital will often require you to go to uh, meetings, uh, whether it's med staff meetings, uh, EMR training and use, and that's just part of it. If you're going to take care of your patient in the hospital, you need to know how to use their EMR or go to their staff meetings, but that's no different than it would be for any patient, any doctor, whether they were a direct care doctor or not. Another thing is your malpractice insurance could be affected by doing inpa inpatient care. I don't think mine's affected much, if any, but that's just one, one thing to consider. Um, and then there are insurance contract issues. Now, most of us don't take any insurance at all, um, but that's not a big deal. Your patient can still basically be taken care of in the hospital, and the hospital might bill it to the insurance company as an out-of-network provider, which is not something that they're not familiar with because not all physicians are contracted with all insurances, so that, that shouldn't be a huge problem. There are issues sometimes just getting your foot in the door whenever you're doing inpatient care. If that's something you want to start doing, um, the best way to do it is, again, right back to the just just do it. Apply for privileges and deal with the uh, confusion of the people who don't understand opted out or whatever and get through it. Is Ultimately, it's not that bad. Other ways to get your foot in the door, you can do some moonlighting at a hospital. Maybe you can cover ER shifts or cover some holidays for their doctors. Again, there's opt-out issues that they'll have to figure out, but a lot of times it's worth it for them. Uh, you can cover for other DPC docs in your area, so you can cover each other. Another way to get your foot in the door at a hospital, if you have a nearby teaching hospital, is you can do some residency teaching or med school teaching and cover for the attendings that work for the residency program. You can also get involved in peer review, so you can help uh, review charts for the hospital, make a relationship with the hospital in that way. And with the coronavirus pandemic, I think hospitals are especially scrambling for inpatient care doctors. Um, and I've got a good friend that he's been trying to get um, back into hospital care. Um, and he's been unable to until they needed a, a doctor to take care of a COVID unit. And so this may be an opportune moment to get your foot back into the door when there's not quite as much bureaucracy and more of a need to be able to care for patients. 
we realized that um, from an inpatient setting, most, um, most family doctors are more likely to care for inpatient medicine than necessarily OB. Um, although this is an area that we want to show that is possible to do within a direct primary care practice. And obstetrics for our office is one of the um, most um, rewarding parts of our practice. Um, it's also been a great way that we've grown as far as patient numbers by taking care of um, young families. Um, it can be a little bit difficult um, to uh, be able to jump back into OB, um, and there's some additional constraints that um, also make it more difficult to get into than some of the other areas of um, expanding your scope in direct primary care. Um, some of these include credentialing for the hospital, um, figuring out call coverage, especially if you're a solo provider, um, and malpractice can also um, sometimes be difficult um, based on the state that you're in as far as an expense goes. Um, but these things for us, um, we've all found ways to, to work through them um, and really have enjoyed our obstetric practice. Um, you can see these are all um, babies that have been, or some of the babies that have been born at Antioch Med, um, and it's just a really fun part of our, um, our current practice. We as family doctors take care of families, and lots of families have babies. Um, and um, this is absolutely true with our practice. Um, the best means of marketing on Facebook is a, a really cute baby in an Antioch Med onesie. I can't agree with Nick any more than that. The best uh, engagement I ever got on any Facebook post to advertise uh, for, for Holden Direct Care is uh, the picture of me and the little baby I delivered the first year I was open. Uh, man, that, that I'm not going to say it went viral, but everybody in town saw it and liked it. And um, it does. It gets, <laughs> it gets a lot of attention. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about the challenges uh, of obstetrics. Um, the first one is going to be um, privileges and turf battles. In bigger cities, there's always going to be issues with turf battles when family medicine physicians want to do OB. Um, the big reason is just because OB, OBGYN wants them all and uh, whatever, they, they want to do all the work and want all the money, I guess. So there's going to be some issues there. Uh, usually if you have sufficient numbers and sufficient training, that's not hard to, to work through. Um, now, practice insurance is a major issue for a lot of doctors and DPC who want to do OB because some states' uh, legal environment makes makes malpractice insurance very expensive if you do OB. Not that it's not worth paying for, but if you don't do a ton and ton of OB, you're not going to probably make the money back to cover the increase in your insurance, which makes it financially difficult to justify adding obstetrics to your scope. So that's going to be a state-by-state -state, um, situation for you. Another challenge in uh, doing obstetrics as part of uh, DPC can be maintaining skills and adequate numbers. Um, if you don't deliver enough babies, you can make it. You can start to feel like you don't have the skills anymore. I actually stopped doing C-sections uh, whenever I got into direct care because I was only delivering 10 babies a year or so, and um, my C-section numbers are low. Uh, or my my percentile is low. I was, I've never been over about 20% at the high end, and that's you know that's just not enough. So I've been relying on surgery for that in our town. But um, uh, the same thing goes for numbers. If you're only delivering one or two babies a year, it's a, it's a pretty hard to argue that. Um, some of those skills can get rusty. So it's something you need to figure out. Are you going to have the number, uh, the numbers to do that? For those who want to practice uh, obstetrics as part of direct primary care, it can be a bit of a challenge getting into it. And we can't go through all of the ways that you can get into it uh, in this video, but uh, we can connect you with those who have done it. And that's uh, something that we we uh, would like to do. So we talked to the doctors in direct care who are doing obstetrics, at least some of them that we are aware of. And uh, they're all more than happy to, uh, to help to help those of you wanting to do obstetrics. So here you can see Dr. Mark, Amber, Jack, Brandon, and Jody, in addition to Nick and I, who are doing OB. You can contact them at the email address as shown uh, with your questions. Um, I actually personally have stopped doing uh, deliveries because our hospital in our town stopped OB two years ago, and I don't have anywhere to deliver. So I still do, I, I do OB uh, care up through about 34, 35 weeks, and then my patients transition to a doctor in another town where they can deliver. But uh, all these other doctors uh, do uh, delivery, and some of them even do C-section. So everything you need to learn, you can learn from the people shown on your screen right now. Well, this is the end of our video. We'll still be glad to stick around and live answer questions uh, for the end of the talk today. Um, you can see my information here, uh, my doc at holdendirectcare.com. My website's there as well. And over to the left, you see the, the place to uh, submit questions. 
um, and we'll be glad to answer as many of those as we can. Yeah, we appreciate you taking time to listen. We're always glad to answer and follow up. Um, for me, email is a great option. Um, note my last name is spelled funny, N-T-O-M-S-E-N at antiochmed.com. Um, thanks for taking time and listening. We hope that we um, encourage you to expand your scope a little bit. We'll be glad to take questions here in a second. And to summarize, just do it. You can do it. Just do it. I wish I could make it more more complicated, but it's that simple. If you add scope, it just takes a little work and it will pay off. Best of luck to you.